Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mishi. And thank you, everybody. So thank you so much and, and good afternoon. Welcome to everyone. We are so, so grateful that you could join us for this information sharing session. We are calling it an information sharing session. It's a session where we want to turn and gravitate a little bit from the discussion around membership to now start talking about some of the processes uh, that have continued throughout this year. Some of them started last year, they continued this year, and we know that they will be continuing in the coming year. And the conversation we want to have is around the Generation Equality Forum. Now, most of us will recall that 2020 is a year that we are actually uh, commemorating 25 years uh, since the adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. 25 years ago, there was a dream. There was a spirit that was moving. And that dream and that spirit that was moving was calling us for equality. It was to demand for equality. It was to demand for women to be treated as equal citizens, as equal people in their countries and in their nations. It is a plan and a strategy that so most of the governments and different actors being able to make concrete commitments and say, what is it that we need to do to move the needle? What is it that we need to do uh, to action and make sure that women and girls are treated as equal citizens in our countries, that they're able to enjoy their rights, rights that are already guaranteed in some of these instruments and frameworks that we know and talk about. And so 25 years later, this is the time we're making a review. And, and last year began the process of that review and the culmination of being able to say no single country can really stand up and say they have achieved gender equality because the challenges have been numerous. The reversals have been real. The commitments remains, but the reality becomes different. Here in Kenya, we say in the ground, it's different because here in our communities, we are feeling something different. And so this conversation is to help us to gravitate towards asking ourselves, what is this Generation Equality Forum? And what are these action coalitions? And what is it that they're promising to deliver? How are they building onto this Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action? What is this that is unique and different? Because women and girls, as we spoke to numerous of them last year, they were saying, we are tired. We are tired of promises that are empty. We are tired of promises that sometimes we feel some progress has been made. And then several steps back that throws us you know, back into even worse from where we are. And the pandemic, the COVID pandemic has actually reminded us that if the systems are working just for a few, the whole structure will continue to crumble in the face of the pandemic and other crises that find us. And so allow me then now just to thank you, each one of you and to welcome the leaders. We have invited the leaders of the action, coalition, um, action coalitions. We have six action coalitions. They'll be speaking to us. They'll be telling us uh, what inspired them um, to, to apply, to want to join the action coalition. What is the vision they have? What is one thing that they are pushing for within the action coalition? What is it that they want to see after these five years of the action coalitions? And to start us off, I would love to invite Eleanor, Eleanor Bloomstrom. Eleanor Bloomstrom is from IWHC, International Women Health Coalition. And uh, IWC is one of the core leaders within the civil society. And Eleanor is going to be talking to us and telling us who are the other action coalition leaders within um, the, 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 the bodily autonomy and sexual reproductive and health rights action coalition. And Eleanor will also be asking you to tell us why do you think it's important for us as African women and girls in all our diversity to engage with this process of the GEF and the action coalition and then like i asked what is one thing that you as eleanor you as iwc what is that one thing that you're pushing for within the bodily autonomy and srhr action coalition you have the floor eleanor welcome thank you so much um i can turn on my video just give me a second so it's really um a pleasure to be here thank you so much for inviting me to be here and um 
be a representative of the Action Coalition for Bodily Autonomy and Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. We're, um, we're a mix of governments, international organizations, UN agencies, philanthropy and civil society organizations. So I'm just going to list them out so you get a sense of who they are. The governments are Argentina, Burkina Faso, Denmark, France, and just in the last few weeks, we were joined by North Macedonia. So there is one African country in the group, um, but their voice hasn't necessarily been as strong as some of the other governments so far. So I think when we get to the how um, to access or influence, we could think about that. The international organization is the Global Financing Facility for Women, Children, and Adolescents from the World Bank. UNFPA is representing the UN. The Children's Investment Fund is the philanthropy organization. And we have two youth-led civil society organizations. The first is Youth Coalition for Sexual and Reproductive Rights. And they're a very large organization and have um, I think membership organizations and members around the world. The other is based in Mexico. It's La Comisión de Niñez y Juventud Indígena. They call themselves ECMIA, and it's about girls, um, indigenous girls and youth. And then the other civil society organizations, in addition to IWHC, are IPPF, International Planned Parenthood Federation, um, FAME, which is the um, Foundation for um, Research and Study of Women in Argentina, ARO, the Asia Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, and then Alliance Droit et Santé, which is um, the Alliance for Rights and Health. We don't have any private sector members so far. The idea is to bring in the private sector, but we haven't had, um, I guess, any interest, and that's a process that's ongoing, which is a very challenging process to figure out how in this multi-stakeholder space that is supposed to be game-changing and bold and progressive and working towards a system change that you were so clear about in your introduction, um, how will the private sector support in that? So there's a lot of thinking that has to be done, I think, before we have our private sector members on board. So that's part one. Um, and that took a long time, apologies, but I think it's really important to know who's in the room in these calls and who's there to make those decisions. UN Women, of course, is always on the calls. Um, and then, so why is it important for African women and girls to engage and how can they engage? I mean, first and foremost, all the action coalitions should center priorities and realities of girls and women's rights activists and feminists who are working on the ground. And that means from every corner of the world, and we know that Africa is an extremely diverse continent with so many different experiences that um, I don't think we can really actually just think of African women and girls coming. We have to really be able to diversify and differentiate those voices as well. And looking at our action coalition, there's not really strong civil society leadership already coming from a base in Africa. So it's a voice that is missing in our everyday conversations, I think, or in our workshop conversations that we have. Um, and as I mentioned before, Burkina Faso is there, but um, there are other countries within Africa that may have really strong influence in this space. And so it's an opportunity to engage those countries and push them to be the leaders uh, in the space and really be progressive. We know that there's been progressive action um, in regional agreements in Africa, and those can be brought to the fore and built upon. And it's also really important to be able to have um, clarity from different groups of women and girls in Africa about what's important to you in your work. I mean, I saw some of the answers about um, the strength that you're feeling and the collective action that you can take. And it's really important to bring that. Consider what are the pressure points in your country or in your region? Um, is it to influence norms or is it to influence budgets? And then as organizations, um, what really can you influence? And is it as a single organization or is it about coming together in this space with FemNet or other um, membership organizations, coalitions and collectives? Voices are so much stronger when they're coming from collectives and coalitions. And um, like I said, it's supposed to be a game-changing, quote unquote, game-changing space. And we need to see that. And um, we need 
we need the voices of African women and girls who can bring that into the space. Another um, piece that I was just in a meeting with another leader from Arrow, and she was saying how so often there's been um, large international organizations with lots of money called upon to speak on behalf of everyone. And so it's time for to stop being represented by those organizations and be there in person um, as an organization with a voice. So I think I'm getting close to my time. Just let me know <laughs> if I'm if I have just a minute left. But there, there are some ways to influence. Um, there's a membership process that's due to be launched coming up. We've heard December, but it may be pushed to January now. I'm not sure. Perhaps some of the other leaders have a much better sense of that. And um, with the members coming on board, I think there are big opportunities to, one, start to define um, their own commitments and what those look like. Um, and to bring those into the Mexico City Forum at the end of March, but also just to get into the space and see if we can figure out a way to have members be a bigger part of decision making at this point, so that it's not only in the hands of the Action Coalition leaders, but also in the meantime, certainly start to advocate to us who have that space and who are in the meetings and bring the collective priorities so that we can have them in front of us in the space when we're in front of governments um, and the UN agencies who do tend to have, try to push their um, agenda sometimes stronger than the civil society. Yeah. And then of course, um, in, the in the region, just advocate to the governments. So the third piece is what would be the one thing, you made it really hard by saying choose one thing. Um, <laughs> so there are general action areas in our coalition around um, comprehensive sexuality education, SRH services with a focus on abortion care and contraception, and then um, a broad sense of autonomy and decision making around sexual and reproductive health and rights. So um, for, for IWHC and for us, it's really about ensuring that any actions are based in human rights and are not replicating what already exists. It is actually time to be bold and move things forward and not be constrained. Um, we really also want to be sure that everyone has what they need to take control of their bodies. And for us, a key priority is access to abortion and the right um, of all people who can become pregnant to, to also self-manage their abortion as, um, as they would want to. Um, and it's a way to increase access. And within that, there's all sorts of things about addressing barriers, um, reforming health systems, and especially norms change and destigmatization, which is a huge issue in many parts of the world. Um, there's another big aspect around consent. And to me, it's all, it's all tied up in there. And I'm sure there are many questions around consent for those of you who are on the call. Um, the final thing I think that I would say is just what we want to see is that all the um, action coalitions are supposed to be coming with an intersectional lens. But we need to really make that a reality and ensure that it's not just talking about the intersectional lens, but bringing in those voices who are able to speak about sex worker rights, um, LGBTQI+, gender nonconforming persons with disabilities in the space. So I will stop there. Um, yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eleanor Bloomstrom. And thank you for reminding us about the importance of our collective action and the strength in our numbers. And the reason we really need to continue to understand uh, who are these leaders, and thank you for giving us you know, the whole list of who are the members, uh, the leaders within the Action Coalition on bodily autonomy and SRHR. But then even when we understand is to be able to see where do we influence, from what level and what point do we start leveraging and being our influence as African women and girls in all our diversity. Um, I also take note of the critical, critical issues. I know I asked for one <laughs> and I could feel you sliding more than one, but yes, yes, very, very important. Women's control of, of their bodies, issues around consent and, and, and very important, the intersectional lens that is very critical. Allow me just to say it again, colleagues and friends, um, we can make use of the chat if you have a burning question uh, that you want to address to any of the action co-leader uh, as, as they speak, 
or anything that you want clarity around or any suggestion that you have and then we'll keep looking at the chat but then also feel free to raise your hand as we progress oh. on allow me now to introduce our second action coalition leader uh, we want to gravitate now towards technology and innovation for gender equality the technology and innovation gender for gender equality one of the core leaders is the global fund for women and with us this afternoon, this evening, is Erin Williams. Allow me to invite you, Erin Williams. And I will also be posing to you um, similar questions so that we can start unpacking and understanding uh, this, this action coalition. First of all, we want to put a face to one of the core leaders in the action coalition. Mm -hmm. But secondly, we want to know who are the other leaders so that even as we do our own advocacy and other sessions that we have, that we are able to connect with them. So allow me to start by saying who are the leaders within the Action Coalition for Technology and Innovation. But then secondly, is to find out why is it important for us to, to, to engage with this Action Coalition and how can we engage? And finally, what is the one thing as Global Fund for Women uh, is you're pushing for. You know, we were just talking about when we had our member session, we're just reflecting around <laughs> how we've all gravitated to using the technology. But we also know that these are spaces that are not safe for women and girls in all their diversity. So we would love to hear from you. What is the one um, one thing? I know there are many, but just one thing. Too uh, many. That you are... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. And hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here. I see so many friends on the on the list of participants. So if I know you and if you know me, hi and um, wishing you all the best. Uh, my name is Erin Williams and I'm the program director for sexual and reproductive health and rights at Global Fund for Women. And I'm also working um, on our technology work. Um, a lot of intersections there, of course, and then also um, so many intersections with technology across all of the work that Global Fund for Women does. So yes, so we are one of the leaders on the Action Coalition for Technology and Innovation. And I'm gonna pull up the other leaders, Rachel. Eleanor did a really good job of explaining and going in detail with all the leaders. So we are one of civil society leads. Um, and then there is Social Builder as well. Um, and they have a priority in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and entrepreneurship for women. A Plus Alliance is another group, and um, they really talk about um, the bias, both racial uh, bias, um, ability bias in algorithms, and um, facial recognition, and really want to see accountability on that front. Um, we also have UNICEF as part of our Action Coalition. We have the International Telecommunications Union as well. Um, and our government partners is the Finnish government, um, the Tunisian government, and the Armenian government. And I think we are actually adding Malawi, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I think we're going to know that on Monday because we have another meeting coming up on Monday. So there'll be some more updates for all of us um, then. And um, our youth partner is Digital Grassroots. And they just joined um, recently. I don't know if you know Digital Grassroots, uh, Rachel and Femnet. Um, and so... We um, are just a, a, little bit be, a little bit more behind, I would say, with all of our leadership. And in terms of the, the private sector, uh, we had a private sector roundtable um, probably about a, two months ago. Um, and I don't know if we have a specific private sector leader at this time. Um, but I also wanna say that we are having a youth roundtable that Digital Grassroots, Grassroots is putting together and that's gonna be in January. Um, so once that information comes out, Rachel, I can send it around to you and you can send it around to folks who might be interested to join. Um, and they're really going to be um, supporting uh, conversations amongst young people, adolescent girls, non-binary trans folks um, to hear what their priorities would be with regards to technology and innovation. So that's coming up in January. So, so looking forward to that. And so I would just say, I mean, there's so much to say, but I mean, we are in a moment of crisis in this world. 
our systems are in crisis, our governments are in crisis. Um, we've had to deal with COVID-19 on top of everything. Um, we do know that SRHR, particularly access to services, has been really, really hampered by this pandemic. Um, Gender-based violence has shot up in this in, across the world during this pandemic. So we know that we are in crisis. Um, and we also know that we can, to a certain extent, turn to technology to support our connection as feminist leaders and movement builders and activists around the world. So we're looking at technology to help us do that. Um, and we also know that technology is a source of incredible harm, right? So there's this tension with technology. It can help on one hand so much to bring us together um, and to support our work and to strengthen the infrastructure of movements. And then it can have incredible harms. And, and we, we know what these harms are. We've all experienced what some of these, these, these harms are. There are privacy breaches of our personal information. There's um, disinformation that can be spread through technology, media manipulation. There's government and private sector surveillance and criminalization, particularly of marginalized communities in the guise of health or in the guise of something else. Um, that's very, very harmful. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we have these harmful digital and technological algorithms and innovations that just continue to reproduce systems of oppression. Um, and so what I think is really, really important is to think about technology from not only the use of it, but also the creation and control of it. And how do we, as Black, Indigenous, people of color, actually take control of technology, right? And create technology that works for us. Because we know that technology is created in certain parts of the world by white, heterosexual, cisgendered, rich men that are the ones that are actually creating what the tools that we use. Um, so it's important that we uh, think about and resource, I mean, I think that's like what obviously Global Fund for Women, I mean, we have to resource feminist technology innovators and feminist movements. It's absolutely critical in order to change and to shift the way that, um, the way that, that, that technology is created. I think that's one of the most important messages. Um, and we also need to really continue to push for accountability and transparency in the private sector and also in governments because they work together and as I mentioned earlier, what some of those harms could be. Um, and we know that those harms really impact migrant workers, they impact trans communities, they impact sex workers. And so how do we stand up and say, no, this is not okay, right? How do we get together and say, we need better mechanisms to monitor them? And then let's just go and create our own stuff and let's resource our own stuff because Technology is, 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 there's a beauty there too. We don't want to always see the negatives in technology and there's opportunities as we know that this pandemic has created a portal as Anandati Roy said, to change the world. Um, and so how do we reframe our overemphasis on this kind of protectionism narrative to a narrative around agency and choice and consent and freedom of expression and joy and dignity and pleasure and, and, and healing justice and solidarity and, and how do we do that with the use of technology, um, I think is, is another really important point to, yes. to lay out. Mm -hmm. And I'll stop there, Rachel, and let others jump in. Great, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Irene. Um, and I think, like I said, this is an information sharing session. We want to cast like the, the, the view of, you know, what are some of the issues, what are some of the priorities that some of the co-leaders are considering uh, within this different action coalition. So just to have a feel of it, um, and, and then feel free if you want to engage a little bit further um, on the chat. And I know Erin is already on the, um, Erin and, 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 and um, Eleanor will be happy to respond to any questions that are also showing up in the chat. Allow me to then now move towards uh, the feminist um, action for climate justice, um, which is the third action coalition that we want to hear from this afternoon and this evening. 
And with us is our sister, Bridget Barnes, uh, Bridget Barnes from WIDO, the Women Environment and Development Organization. Uh, WIDO, welcome. And again, I think let's, let's, let's just have a feel of who are these other core leaders that you have been, um, you know, huddling together. And, and planning together, who are these other action core leaders, uh, action coalition leaders within the feminist action for climate justice, but then also start mentioning to us what are the priorities that you're very, very passionate around in terms of pushing and where do you see us being able to engage and working collectively? Even as we were reminded by Eleanor, there's the strength in numbers. How do we build on that strength in numbers on issues to do with climate justice? Welcome, Bridget. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I hope you don't mind that I keep my camera off. I, I'm actually stepping in for my sister, Selena, from the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, who's a dear co-lead as well in this. And so um, I'm still in my pajamas. And although they are cute, I'm going to just spare all of you <laughs> um, uh, the, the image. Um, uh, yes, and so I'm really, really happy to be here with you um, to give you a little bit of information about the Feminist Action for Climate Justice Action Coalition. And um, Erin and Eleanor have already identified some of the structures of how these different action coalitions work in terms of where the co-leads are and that we've been through a series of workshops now trying to really get through the process of how we work together what is our shared vision for what it means, for example, to work on feminist action for climate justice in, in my case? Um, and now kind of getting to the steps on this question of, okay, in, in five years, what does transformation look like? What do these actions look like? And I just, I've seen Esther's question here in terms of, you know, how are these priorities being set and how can you influence this process? Um, and so I wanted to speak to that in particular and say that at least for, at least in our coalition, you know, we're really conscious of the fact that we want to be bringing in a really large diversity of views into what these action areas should look like. And so I'm sharing a quick um, presentation here from a consultation held last week. So you'll see uh, it has a different date on it. Um, and these consultations were open and, and to any members of the, the networks that the action co-leads that we have are part of. Um, you're very much welcome to read through that. It's gonna, you can follow along because it has some of this basic information I'm gonna share with you now on what has happened so far. We also took people through the different action areas that have been, I would say they're somewhat buckets of actions. Uh, and then we did a brainstorming on what the what the action areas could look like. So I'm gonna just quickly go, go through a few things, not not this this slide itself. And then at the end, um, I'm sure you'll do your own brainstorming, but I'll also leave my contact information. I'll share Selena's contact information. If there are ideas that you have about these action areas, it would you'd be very welcome to bring them in. Obviously, this is just the starting point as we, as the co-leads try to introduce these blueprints, as Eleanor said, as a next step, members should be able to join these different action areas and, and you and women will also be hosting a more public facing consultation on the action areas. So I think at every stage, there's gonna be an opportunity for input. Um, I wanted to share in terms of the co-leads of our action coalition, um, we have uh, several, CSO co-leads, um, uh, the ALGA Association, which is a, a grassroots women's organization based out of Kyrgyzstan, the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, which we're really proud to continue to work in partnership with. Um, and I know that uh, Pakja and Femnet are working closely together around, <clears throat> excuse me, around creating consultations uh, at the intersection of economic justice and climate justice. Um, Diva for Equality, which is a grassroots organization, frontline feminist organization based out of the Pacific, and then we do. And we're joined by three youth organizations. One is Girls for Climate, which is based out of Uganda, um, the Green Hope Foundation in Canada, and then uh, uh, Tejiendo Pesamiento in Colombia. And then our philanthropy co-lead is uh, Global Green Grants Fund. 
in addition, our as our action coalition structure, we have two member states. So we have this uh, Costa Rica, as well as the Maldives. And then we have both an international organization through the International Fund for Agricultural Development. And then we have a UN consortium of um, some of the leading UN agencies that do work at the intersection of gender and climate. So we have the Conservation for the International Union, oh, sorry, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, um, UNDP, UNEP, uh, and the UN uh, climate change convention, so the framework convention on climate change. And we as organizations and co-leads have been meeting both inside the formal structure that UN Women has hosted for us in terms of workshops to think through the different action areas. Uh, and we've also been really relying upon the broad networks and movement connections that we've had for many years to try to outline what these um, actions could look like. I would say that, you know, We've, we've now kind of in conversation come together around four different, uh, I would say buckets of action areas under the Climate Justice Action Coalition. One which is really recognizing, of course, the incredible gendered um, implications and gender diverse um, uh, ways in which people face the impacts of climate change and how can we work to expand women and girl in women and girls access and control over productive uh, resources such as climate finance technologies and knowledge. How can we enhance and leverage the capacity of all women and girls uh, to build resilient um, build resilience to climate and disaster risks to mitigate climate change to address loss and damage. And I think that one of the areas that we're particularly really thinking through what transformative action would look like is how do we enable women and girls and all their diversity to lead a just transition to an inclusive circular and regenerative green economy what does that mean what does that look like how do we divest from the systems of harm that are fueling climate change whether that is um, the investments in the large-scale extractive industry that we know is having not only harm on our planet but harm is creating violence against women and girls around the world um, creating systems of extraction that um, are not enabling uh, us to be able to invest in, in care and invest in a care economy so how do we kind of create uh, transformative actions that actually allow for that divestment from harm to be able to invest in care. And just on that one question of what's the one thing we hope to see, again, that is the hard, that, that's the hardest question of all. Um, but certainly we have heard a lot from the different consultations that we've held that people want to see a real transformation in, in participation and leadership and consent at all levels. So a real instrument, um, a real oper operationalization of free prior and informed consent that women leaders, grassroots women leaders at the forefront in their communities are part of decision making around sustainable development, environment and climate change that finance is not that the current financial mechanisms we have around climate finance are just not fit for purpose for getting and delivering resources to women's organizations, grassroots communities, where we've seen across the board women leading on solutions around seed saving, agroecology, um, uh, energy uh, cooperatives, and how do we fundamentally protect the rights um, and bodily autonomy of, of all women and girls and all the diversity uh, in, in a changing climate and in a challenging environment to make sure that their human rights are protected. So we have um, those kind of bucket areas. And, and again, as my last piece, if anyone, I'll put contact information in here. You can see more details about these action areas in that presentation I shared and any ideas or thoughts on what you see as the transformative action that needs to be taken for climate justice. Um, you can be directly in touch with us and I'm sure more modalities will be coming out in the next couple of weeks on how to get engaged in framing those actions. Great, 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 great. Thank you so much, Bridget. And, and thank you also for reminding us that actually the other reason why we're having this information sharing is so that we can be able to cross-share our contacts 
uh, but also how to start having the cross section of the issues. And I like what you brought out in terms of the bodily autonomy and how it connects to the climate justice uh, work that you're doing within the action coalition. So again, a fusion, a coalition of how these different action coalitions actually um, intersect, uh, even as we're talking about the whole uh, overall vision of, of the generation equality. We started by saying that it's a game changing, you know, scalable actions, but how do we still continue connected so that we avoid having the silo kind of way of working? So thank you so much, Bridget. I now want us to hear from the Gender Based Violence Action Coalition. And I'd love to invite Yvonne, Yvonne Wamari from Outright International uh, to again, take us through Yvonne, tell us Yvonne, uh, who are the other leaders that you are plotting together within the Action Coalition? The, the rises in gender-based violence has just been crazy, particularly this year, you know. And, and, you know, we're just saying, you know, what is this? What is the Action Coalition looking into? What are you promising? What is what, that one thing uh, as Outright International you're pushing for? Um, and, and how can we engage uh, with the Action Coalition? And yes, thank you, Irene. Thank you, uh, Eleanor. Let's keep dropping our emails and how we can continue to engage with one another. Thank you and welcome, Yvonne. Okay, thank you so much, um, Rachel. And thank you to Femnet for the invitation to be here today and talk about the Gender-Based Violence Actual Coalition. So I'm Yvonne Wamari and I'm the Africa Program Officer out, Outright Action International, which is one of the oldest global organizations that has been working for 30 years defending and advancing the right, human rights of les lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and uh, queer individuals globally. Now, um, Outright Action International is a, a core leader in the Gender-Based Violence Action Coalition, and we are in this together with the um, four member states, Iceland, Kenya, United Kingdom, and Uruguay, uh, one international organization, which is the European Commission. We have two UN agencies, that is the United Nations Entity for Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women, and the World Health Organization. One philanthropy, which is the Ford Foundation, programs a lot around um, gender-based violence issues. And we have one, two, three, four, four civil society organizations, two, no, five civil society organizations, actually two global organizations, ourselves, Outright Action International, and the Global Coalition on Inclusive and Safe Spaces and Cities for Women and Girls. And then we have another organization that is representative of the MENA region, Abad Resource Center and Gender Equality. And then there is the European Women's Lobby, which is representative of the EU. And then we have Breakthrough, which is an NGO uh, in India. Um, of course, we are supported by the youth-led organizations, one from Guatemala, Las Ninas Lideran, and another from Zimbabwe called Yes Trust. Um, yeah, so that is the composition of the GBV Action Coalition. And like, why is it important for, for us to engage at this level with the Generation Equality Forum and with the Action Coalitions? Um, I think for me, mostly it's because uh, it is a multi-generational platform that offers African girls and young women in all their diversity um, the space to be able to articulate issues that are very specific to them. Um, as you've already mentioned, Rachel, during this time um, of COVID, when we are on lockdown and we are forced to, you know, work from home and be in a space where you are in a confined space with, with um, individuals, we've seen a rise of um, gender-based violence cases, and this has been cross-cutting. And for instance, among the LGBTIQ community, we have witnessed um, cases of, of conversion therapy of, or conversion practices or soji change practices where individuals are being forced to, um, lesbians are being forced to either get married to a man or, um, uh, uh, um, reports of corrective rape during this time um, and that has been like and that has been really really um, affected quite a number of of individuals 
and it also plays to um, you know the mental and the psychological trauma that then you know um, individuals have to bear with for the rest of their lives really um, so you know this really offers us a platform and engagement through these action coalitions will ensure that our collective voices are being heard especially on the particular issues that we are facing as African girls as um, adolescent girls, as African women, as um, lesbian, bisexual, queer um, women, as women with disabilities, that our voices are heard and that the voice of all those who have been silenced and stigmatized for decades, that their voice is amplified within this space. So our active like presence and um, participation in the space is critical because it will guarantee that we own the narrative that we create. We own the narrative around gender-based violence and it speaks to us and it speaks to our lived realities. And we also have an ownership of the discourse and the solutions that we want to see in order to be able to drive this transformative change that we are talking about at the end of all this, this whole process. Um, uh, it, it also gives us an opportunity when once we're speaking with one voice and once we are speaking in, in, in unity, then we also ensure that there's inclusion and non-discrimination so that this change uh, processes that we, we are looking to, to put in place and the change that we want to see speaks to all the diverse needs and issues that we grapple with at the local level. Um, yeah, so it's the young women and the, the girls uh, in, within Africa, within our networks, within our membership, we need to take the reins and actively engage in the process of setting these priorities within these actual coalitions, but not just setting the priorities and then leaving it at that, but also intentionally monitoring um, the results that we want to see after the process. Um, I'm not to repeat what has already been mentioned in terms of engaging with the the um, with the the whole forum, but I'll just add on to what Eleanor had already mentioned, which is um, there's a, the ongoing um, UN Women Generation Equality Forum curated discussions, and that really offers a space where we can we can discuss and we can we can share the challenges that we are facing and these would be taken into consideration in in um in uh prioritizing um issues within the generation equality forum so there are a series of them that have been ha that that are going to take place one already took place i think it was in september or early october i'm not quite sure but then there are others that are coming that are coming up. Um, I think there's one on um, intergenerational activism, and there's another. I don't quite remember the title of the next one that's coming up. Um, but let, let let us participate in those spaces, even if we can't participate all of us. But through our leadership and through our coalitions, then we can be able to participate. Um, one thing that outright is looking to push within the GBV Action Coalition. Um, yeah, there are uh, priority areas, but I think those are still um, very young in the infancy in the, in the discussion. And I know there's a meeting that is taking place this week to further discuss the priority areas of the Action Coalition. But as outright, we are looking to drive, um, we're looking to drive and support um, funding and participation and recognition of feminist organizations um, which we which we strongly believe is a necessity in order for us to be able to develop the work that we need to do in combating gender-based violence not just globally but at regional and national level as well so one way that we want to do this is by countering um by countering the shrinking civic space and be able, being able to support registration of feminist um, ngos um, another thing that we are hoping, another priority area that we are hoping to really push through is, um, you know, we're all aware that the, of the criminalization of um, lesbian, bisexual and gender non-conforming <clears throat> persons and how that is a barrier to the fulfillment of their human rights. So we, we would like to take a legal policy and public awareness measures in order to combat these prejudices. Uh, the stigmas and the stereotyping 
and you know, hoping that this would be like a stepping stone to the protection of all these individuals against gender-based violence. And just looking at that in the realm of legal and the policy space. Um, I think I'm well within my time and I'll stop there. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yvonne. And I and I hear you. I think the priorities are many um, that we want to drive, that we want to push. But I think, like I said, it's just for us to give us a snippet. And thank you for reminding us the need to take the reins and really not just be part of setting the priority, but also monitoring and being able to hold all these co-leaders and others accountable to these commitments. Like we started by saying that this is for five years, the action coalitions are timed within a five-year time frame. So it's something that we want to be part of in terms of influencing those uh, priorities that are going to be uh, the final action coalition actions, but then also monitoring again to see what is that game changing action that would have taken place within the five years. Thank you very much, you, my sister Yvonne, and thank you for sharing with us. Again, like all of us, let's drop our email so that we can see how to keep um, 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 connecting and conversing beyond uh, this information sharing session. I think I want now to invite um, Again, another sister, Aisha Rahamatali. Aisha Rahamatali is one of the core leaders within the Economic Justice and Rights Action Coalition. Uh, Karibu and welcome, Aisha. Sante Sana. Sante, thank you so much, Rachel, for um, this opportunity. I'm really, really grateful to be, to be in this discussion and uh, to be able to share about the Economic Justice and Rights uh, Action Coalition. I think the structure is the same for all of us. Um, and I'm just going to do like my sisters did and list uh, the different uh, you know, uh, leaders that we have in our action coalition. So in terms of foundations and philanthropy, we have the Gates Foundation um, as our, one of our co-leader. We also have, uh, in terms of international organization, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, and the UN national, national, national unit, unit, oh, stop. United Nations, sorry, <laughs> Capital Fund. You know, we used to say UNCDF, so when you have to unpack the uh, acronyms, it gets complicated. <laughs> um, in terms of governments, we have Sweden, uh, Spain, uh, Germany, Mexico, and South Africa. Uh, we also have youth representative in our uh, action coalition, uh, Manki Marua, that are based in Cameroon and Anyar from Guatemala. In terms of civil society organizations, we have FEMNET, of course, in our action coalition, the International Trade Union Conf Confederation, ITUC, the Women Working Group on Financing for Development, the Huayru Commission, and Care International um, as part of this cohort. And I have to say, I feel like we are a really strong uh, CISO group. We've already started organizing ourselves and discussing regularly about how do we make sure that uh, we bring in our sisters and women's organizations' uh, voices into the process. In terms of private sector, we have PayPal, um, who is our uh, private sector leader. And actually they joined us only two weeks ago, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So they are quite new into the process. So on the question of why I think um, women and girls from Africa should join this process, you know, without repeating what everybody said, um, I feel like, uh, you know, the, the COVID pandemic actually has had showed us and, uh, and the impact that it had has been really strong. And, and I think, we, uh, you know, African women have been um, really impacted by it. Um, and, and, and I think these action coalitions really give us um, a, a moment to focus and really play a key role, a key role you know, to reset the past and, and, and bring things to, um, you know, to the right uh, moment and, and space to um, um, advance the 2030 agenda and the vision of Beijing, as you were saying it earlier, uh, Rachel. So again, I think that it's really important to have the women's voice into the process as we are actually right now discussing and, and, and fleshing out the different uh, blueprint actions. And, um, and, and while those are global agenda and global ambition, I really feel that the proposed action and tactics that we are going to propose are going to be uh, implemented at country, national, regional level. So I think it's really important to have those voice of women um, that are experiencing the, the, the impact and the, and the difficulties and the issues into the process. The other thing that I think that is really important is the expertise that this group uh, of women bring into the process. Uh, I think all my uh, colleagues said it uh, about you know, how it's important to have 
your voices into the decision making. So um, I think that as we engage uh, in, um, in in this process and as we look at the five years plan, your views are going to be really important. You know, uh, accountability, uh, the, the definition of the issues, and I feel like these next six months, starting January, are going to be really critical to get your voices as we are wrapping up the negotiations and fine tuning. You know, what actions we want to see into the process. I also think one element that I think is, is key for us to, to engage is that it also, this process also offers us an opportunity to influence policies for shaping and increasing funding for women's rights and feminist organizations. And, and I feel like um, this is a chance to, 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 to try to tap in and, and to be involved in. And, and finally, uh, related to our action coalition, I think South Africa has been really strong from the beginning of the process um, in their engagement. They are also sharing the African Union right now. So I feel that for, for women and girls to engage uh, in this process and, and really influencing um, South Africa and looking at its influence, not only as a country, but at continental level uh, to shape the economic justice and rights agenda is really, is really important. Um, I think most of the things have been said around the how, uh, you know, uh, we talked about the membership, uh, the curative discussions, uh, I also think that uh, the Generation Equality Forum pu public conversation that UN Women is planning to launch in January will also be a space. And uh, this um, Generation Equality Forum public conversation will be spaces for women's organizations across the globe that are not present the governance structure to really share and exchange, uh, uh, discuss on the act um, outcome of the Action Coalition, it will also advise us on what we need to do. And, and I feel that those spaces, if we use them well, is gonna be a digital platform. And once we know more as uh, leaders from, this, uh, from the Action Coalition, we will make sure that we, we share that information um, while in advance for you to be able to, to contribute to it. And, and the other thing that, that I wanted to, to mention on this is uh, we are trying uh, to, to, do, to do our best, you know, to, um, to engage with women's organizations and youth organizations. But I really feel like it's also, it will be really helpful for us to, to hear from you, not only for us to tell, for you to tell us what kind of issues you want us to raise, what kind of solutions you want us to bring in the process and what kind of experience you want, you want there, but also tell us we would like you to involve us like this. Like, for example, I always think that these uh, feminist platforms are really good spaces to engage. So how would uh, women's rights, youth, feminist movements would like us to engage with them um, in, a, in, a, in a meaningful way would be really helpful to get that insight um, uh, from, from, from you all. In terms of, uh, of the priorities, similar to what uh, the other action coalitions have been doing, we've now defined our, our vision. Uh, we are starting to looking at the themes and sub themes and action that we want to, to achieve. And we are looking at not only tackling structural inequalities like the care economy, for example, but looking also at how to accelerate progress in key areas related to economic justice and rights. Uh, just to give you a, an idea of um, the issues that are surfacing from uh, in our action coalition, uh, the care economy, decent work, access and, um, access and control over resources, and fiscal reform and stimulus packages are some of the issues that we've started exploring um, uh, as an action coalition. So when it comes to what is the issue uh, that CARE would like to, or that I would like to, uh, to push for, this one is really hard, uh, Rachel. <laughs> so uh, just to say that, hello? Can you hear me? Can I yes, can I request the host kindly to mute? There's somebody whose phone is, um, microphone is still on. Yes, thank you. Go on, Aisha. What oh, is sorry. the one thing? I'm almost there. <laughs> and the most difficult question, I have to say. Um, so yeah, I think for, uh, for, for us as an organization uh, and building on the experience and what we've seen in our engagement globally is uh, uh, one of our key asks will be around advancing women's financial inclusion and really focusing on achieving financial inclusion and universal um, protection as one goal, you know, outlining pathways to get there, building on scalable uh, and formal and formal financial inclusion tactics. And from a personal level, I really feel like this conversation that we're having and the need for women's voice and co-leadership in the process, but also after the, the, the September deadline, um, in the economy, in the society, in politics is really something that I'll keep pushing as a human rights, because, you know, as we say, 
nothing about us without us. And I think you resonate a lot with what you said earlier, Rachel, around, you know, we are tired of promises that are taken without us and that are not really moving forward. So, so yeah, I'll stop there. I know that I have a few of my colleagues in the Action Coalition, in addition to Femnet, I see yes. the Women Working Group financing, uh, for Financing for Development in the call. So we're really happy to work with you and to respond to any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aisha. And thank you also giving a shout out uh, to the other Action Coalition leaders within economic justice and rights. And yes, yes. Uh, we are almost getting there. I think let me just take this opportunity to remind us, do you have a question for any of the Action Coalition leader? Do you have a comment? Do you have a contribution? Feel free to keep sending in the chat, uh, but then also raise your hand and I will be acknowledging. Now we are moving towards the, uh, the sixth, which is the final Action Coalition. And I just wanted to check if Shamiso is here with us. I'm trying to look at the list of participants. Shamiso. Yes. Hi, good oh, afternoon. Great, great, great. I was looking for Shamiso S. Thank you. Shamiso from the Gender Links uh, is the Action Coalition co-leader for the feminist movements and leadership. Welcome, Shamiso. And we are using the same format. Tell us briefly <laughs> who are the other co-leaders? What is your priority as Gender Links? How do we engage? Welcome, okay. Shamiso. Thank you so much, Rachel, um, and um, thank you for the opportunity. Good afternoon, good evening to everybody, and um, it's great to share this platform um, as Feminist members. We were just able to speak and, you know, reflect on just um, the process that's taking place in Generation Equality Forums. So GenderLinks is part of the um, Coalition 6, which is basically... Um, movement, um, which is basically feminist movement and leadership. We are part of a consortium that has um, member states. The member states that we have are Canada, the Netherlands and Ethiopia. We have recently been joined by Malawi. We were very happy to have Malawi on board because Malawi is really quite um, the Malawi government in terms of um, feminist, you know, um, policy making and review. They seem to always in the African region or the SADC region, so to speak. They seem to always be, you know, the lead in that um, specific area. So we were very happy to be joined by um, Malawi and me, Emma, who I know is also a fem feminist um, board member, was very key and instrumental in just that process and just getting Malawi on board. So that's really quite exciting to have a global South. Um, organ I mean, member states in the coalition. In terms of international organizations, we have um, IPU, which is the Consortium of Interparliamentary Union. We also have intercities and local governments, which is UCLG. Um, we also have women political leaders. Um, those are just mainly the international organizations that make part of the consortium. We also have the UN agency. I think, as you know, the UN really leads this process. And for us, we have um, UHS. HR, UHSCHR, not to get a tongue twister. So we're really happy to have the support of the UN agency throughout the process. In terms of philanthropies, we have um, Open Society Foundation, OFS, and then of course, civil society is a big, has a big component. So we have ourselves, Gender Links, and we are based in South Africa, as you know. Then we also have um, CREA, and then we have Eurocentral Asian Lesbians Community as well as International Women's Development Agency and INPMI. I will not try and pronounce it because it's French. And then we also have Women Enabled um, International. So it's really, really great to have a lot of strong feminist organizations that believe in um, political leadership from a feminist perspective. Um, to move on to this first question, um, which is why is it important for African women and girls to engage and how do they engage? So I think like all, you know, like the rest have really mentioned, um, it, it really is key because even as we've seen with COVID-19 and just the ripple effects that it's had in terms of like advances that have been made, whether it's in terms of Beijing or whether it's, you know, the SDGs or just general gender equality strides that had been made, there are, there have been new challenges that have come on board. So we need to have African women and girls engage in the process because their voices must be heard and their solutions must be heard because the solutions we really believe come from the ground which is why even as we are leading this process of being part of this coalition, we really emphasize just the voices from the global south are really, really key and African women really sit in those spaces. Um, so in terms of um, what it is that gender links is really like trying to push in, you know, um, and what it is that we see as, you know, 
coming out of this five-year process is we're really trying to push for a creation of safe spaces for feminist movements and this includes um you know availing resources to feminist movements so that they can thrive so a lot of times people hear about feminist movements or women's rights organizations or whether it's your you know your non-binary um organizations non-lgbti binary organizations the challenge is always in financing and in always resources um that enable these organizations to thrive so that is a key part that we really want to promote promote and push for. Um, so just really, that's a big part. And that also involves lobbying member states for an enabling environment, because we're also aware that even though we might have these great organizations, but if the policies in the national countries are actually criminalizing the activities we're trying to engage and the things that we're trying to foster, or whether the human rights, um, you know, just the human rights, um, statements that we're trying to really ensure that people can live a free and equal life livelihoods we can we cannot get anywhere because then we have penal codes that you know really would limit us in terms of the work that we're trying to do so really lobbying member states is a big big part of um just creating this enabling environment where basically policies must be reviewed and changed if there's need for change um another element we, we are working on just um pushing in terms of gender links is also like you know just having feminists movements and leaders you know having building capacity and opportunities you know to participate in political decision making so in a lot of our political countries i know me emma mentioned earlier when we were talking about just elections in malawi and what that has meant for women you know in terms of political participation of women in malawi you would see that there have been advances that had been made that now in the current state you know there's almost like a setback so to speak and quite a few countries have experienced similar results so it's really really important to just keep pushing for or, you know opportunities for political participation where women are able to be decision makers and women are able to engage and where economic justice is available for women because once it starts from a political angle then it can you know it it kind of like grows down and there's a ripple effect into all the other sectors so definitely mentioning that um you know political participation is key in bringing about this enabling environment so i think another key issue is also like freedom from sgbv which we know the other action coalition teams really um head that but that is also just something that we really push for and then i mean in terms of the tactics and trying to bring about um just these opportunities and really trying to promote learning and sharing amongst feminist movements um we also really believe in the online platform i think covid 19 has taught us that that there's a lot of online learning that can take place and that is feminist movements um we can actually Actually engage in summits and intergenerational learning opportunities and even just exchange visits once of course COVID-19 allows us so there are really really a lot of um, things we think are importantly and instrumentally intergenerational and that leads me back to the main well the, the first question which is how do we engage young women and girls so there are definitely a lot of platforms um, on the generational equality forum where young I mean, organizations can take can participate as well as individuals can participate in just the conversations and the decisions and just how we proceed in terms of, you know, um, code of conduct and the like. So there are definitely opportunities. And in terms of like the grassroots, because I know people always mention, so what about the rural women who don't have access to a phone or the internet and the like? So I think that's where we really depend on our partners, which is why I think you see that um, the action coalitions are really made up of, you know, different stakeholders, because it's a, basically a partnership where we depend on our partners to then go out and really reach out to those um, most marginalized and vulnerable women and girls in terms of just, you know, opportunities to speak to a process that is supposed to be a game changer and that's supposed to make opportunities and livelihood much better as we move forward um, in the next, you know, of course, it's a five-year process, but, you know, as we look forward to the next 25 years, so to speak. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes. in a no, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sami. So thank you very much. I think, like I said, as an information sharing session, we just want to have like a bit, you know, of what is your priorities as the Action Coalition co-leaders. But then we, we will also be requesting you, we can share with us your contacts so that we can see how else we can keep engaging with you, Shami. So thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much. And even for reminding us that the feminist realities is not in the future. The feminist realities are here with us and we need to continue strengthening the feminist movement uh, across across the continent but also worldwide i think i just want to again um, invite all of us now we have actually had a, a feel through around all the six action coalition and thank you to each and every co-leaders including the ones who had to jump out briefly but just, just to say thank you thank you for painting that broad picture for us um, i'm also noting in the chat that venge is is joining us is here with us venge maybe i can give you a minute i can 
give you a, um, a, maybe two minutes uh, just to you know share with us from the UN Women uh, some of the timelines that we are looking around, uh, the process and how we can continue to engage. One of the questions we've been um, asking all the action, coali co coali action coalition leaders is how can African women and girls in all their diversity, how do they engage uh, with this process? Venge, if you can hear me, you can have the floor for two minutes, please. Hi, Rachel. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Um, thank you so much for giving me the uh, floor. I, di I didn't expect that I would be speaking today. Um, more listening in. And um, anyway, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Venge Nyirongo. I'm the thematic lead for the Economic Justice and Rights Action Coalition. And so I do work with all 16 um, action coalition leaders in really shaping the blueprints for the Action Coalition for Economic Justice and Rights. Um, for, uh, for this Action Coalition, we um, have done quite a lot. We have explored what are really the unmet feminist asks within the economic justice and rights framing. We have looked at what are the critical constraints uh, analyzed using data evidence information and knowledge that has come from um, the entire world, uh, from the grassroots, from individual uh, levels, all the way to uh, the global processes that determine uh, the policy making, the normative frameworks around women's economic justice and rights. And this is where we have now arrived at these four emerging um, areas where we are looking at addressing um, challenges for women and girls within the care economy, challenges for women and girls within the decent work um, and entrepreneurship areas. We're also looking at how we can enhance and really come up with uh, lasting solutions on women's economic self-reliance uh, as it pertains to productive resources um, and assets. We're also um, looking at uh, seeing how uh, we can make inroads on reforming fiscal uh, policies as well as uh, fiscal stimulus packages and in part trying to make sure that uh, this particular action as well as the other ones also have um, a response to the ongoing uh, COVID-19 pandemic which may have direct or indirect impacts on um, the progress we want to make on economic justice and rights for women and girls. Um, in terms of timelines, we are looking ahead towards uh, end of March, uh, that's dates 29th, 30th and 31st, which is going to be a convening of um, uh, various stakeholders uh, in Mexico City, where the expectation is that we will have finished developing the Action Coalition blueprints that uh, colleagues have already spoken to uh, quite eloquently and clearly. And um, once that happens, we will be taking the Action Coalition blueprints for a launch in Paris in June. The dates for the Paris uh, conference have not yet been confirmed, but we're all looking at these uh, two connected um, conferences as a great exciting opportunity where we can revive the commitments that the world made uh, in Beijing 25 years ago. And um, this time we're really trying to shape the actions in a way that creates tangible concrete opportunities for action, tangible concrete opportunities for real change. Because when we left Beijing 25 years ago, we see that although there has been progress in certain areas, we have not really made a dent on gender equality. And uh, looking at the opportunities that the Economic Justice and Rights um, Action Coalition can create, we feel that this is going to be a critical component to challenge prevailing economic systems that do not work for women and girls and make sure that we can make a lasting change. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Venge. And thank you also for allowing me just to 
uh, invite you within, you know, just share with us what you shared with us, just to say thank you. And I think it's important for us to also, like I say, to put a face <laughs> or maybe a name to this, some of these processes. Uh, the conversation, like I said, started last year, have continued this year amidst all the challenges we've been having. And there's a lot of expectation that next year there will be a lot that will be happening. I think the rallying call, the clarion call that African women and girls present here are saying is that nothing about us without us. We want to be part of the process. We want to take on the reins uh, to set the priorities, but also to follow through um, even as you're talking about, you know, the, the process in Mexico, in Paris, but also throughout the, the five years and be able to come back after five years and say, at least there's been some progress, even if it's a shift in the social norms and the gender, um, um, some of the social gender norms that we, we realize are the ones that continue to hold us back, even as we say we are making some progress. So allow me Colleagues, just again to quickly, I'm just looking into my chat. I'm trying to look if there's a hand um, opening just for plenary for a few minutes. Uh, um, what I have noted is that most of the, you know, conversations in the chat is comments, a few questions that uh, colleagues also responded to. Uh, but then also then take this minute in the next couple of minutes, I invite Lois, uh, because we just want now to you know, gravitate a little bit uh, from the generation equality and action coalition conversation, but talk about the CSW 65, the 65th session of the Commission on the Status of Women next year in March. And to have that conversation, to lead us in that conversation is Lois, uh, Lois from Wildaf in Ghana. Uh, if you can just take a few minutes just to run through and tell us how can we engage and what are the timelines looking like uh, uh, for us to be able to engage with CSW 65. Lois, are you there? Hello, Rachel. I'm around. Great. Okay. So thank you so much for the opportunity to um, be the ones to share the information on um, what we are proposing for CSW next year. And the proposal for next year is um, because of COVID, um, the effects of COVID and uh, inability to bring us together in New York, as we've always been doing, we um, we seek to be proposing that um, we have it virtual. Um, this um, have it virtual, and it um, so um, so we would rather be registering, which then we have the links out already. Um, we will be to be in March. The, um, the match, um, the second week in March, the second and third week in March, and we'll be registering. Um, we'll be paying between twenty-five dollars, and also um, for um, participation. And then we'll also be registering on parallel our parallel sessions, which has got to do with um, we have from now to the fourteenth, and um, the parallel sessions to we've advertised it online. We are supposed to all register organizations that will be interested in um, putting up any session. We are supposed to register the team for CXW 65 is on um, women's participation um, in decision making and then also on gender based violence with reference to COVID 19. So these are the teams for next year CSW and it was going to be virtual and we will. Um, because of the time zones, we will have it um, um, based on the various at the continental level. So we'll have the African session, we will have the um, other um, blocks because we don't want to inconvenience anybody where we'll be having parallel sessions that will be taking place midnight when um, we could, you, you, you could have had it in the day. So um, we were supposed to, this meeting was to help us to be able to come together and see what, how we can be able to navigate around these proposals that is um, already um, being um, rolled out for us to know what is really the best um, for us as the continent. How do we plan to ensure that um, CSW come off next year and how are we going to do it virtually? Um, I think that I will not want to talk so much. I will um, ask my other colleagues, um, John Zua and Mamori, to add on to um, how we seek to plan CSW next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, 
Great, great. Thank you very much, Lois. Zonziwo, are you here? Do you want to add anything? I also see Memory has shared with us the link for the NGO CSW that we can also check uh, for the timelines. Allow me just to mention that FEMNET will continue to share updates with you, our members. I know uh, most of the people on this call is FEMNET members, but in case you're not a member of FEMNET, I just want to drop an email here where you can send us and we will be sending regular updates around the Generation Equality Forum, the Action Coalition, CSW, and other processes uh, that will be happening in 2021. Again, also to extend an invitation to you to consider being a member of FEMNET and let's keep growing the family. So really just to say thank you very much. I don't see a hand, I don't see a question. And so I, I would request that we also move on to, on to the next um, session in our agenda. And the next session in our agenda is to welcome Memory, uh, Memory Kachambwe, who will be inviting um, Dr. Binka uh, to give our closing remarks. Um, Memory, Karibu. Um, thank you so much, Rachel, for really making sure this uh, session was interesting, but also engaging. I think we are still full of so much information, but I think it's always important. What I just wanted maybe to emphasize around uh, CSW 65 next year is that the deadline for submission of parallel events uh, for the NGO CSW uh, 65 platform is the 14th. So by next week, um, just make sure you, you just go on to the link and you can also just log on, submit a short concept note so that you're also part of the, the virtual platform and the virtual meeting that we'll be having. Uh, this year is going to be really, really, um, next year to be exciting for us to explore. You know, we've always had issues for women who are not able, particularly our young women, who are not able to attend CSW physically in New York. So this year, uh, next year will be really groundbreaking in that we will be having um, space for communities that have not been able to attend. And we're also hoping that even within the different um, communities, people will be able to put together, it could be groups of women in the different um, areas to come together and maybe share or maybe access um, some of this platform. So we really hope we be having those satellite um, sort of like meetings. So we are urging you in your respective countries, in your respective communities to get women engaged, but to also get women to, to be part and participate um, in what's happening. Um, a very interesting feature of the NGO CSW platform is a space where you can meet with anyone in Asia, anyone in in all the uh, in all the continents. So there's also that virtual platform to exchange ideas and to get a bit of a sense and a feel of what um, CSW is like. So that hoping if the physical allows us, we'll be able to go there. But I think it's a great, great, great platform. We are still waiting and Fenge, you may uh, correct me. We are still waiting from just to hear from the UN side in terms of how the negotiations will go. But I also wanted to urge you to uh, to look at the, we know so the, the document which is presented, the document which is agreed upon during CSW, uh, we expect to be having the draft um, in December. And then if not in December, it will probably come up in January. So the document that will be agreed upon is already, there's a draft, uh, but we'll be waiting for the first official draft to come out in December. And then after that, uh, the final to be closed, I think, sometime in January. But like what Rachel said, um, oh, oh, thank you so much, Rosa. So, oh, thank you so much, Rosa. This is great. You see, that's why it's good to have uh, all our sisters in the spaces. So it's been corrected. Um, I'm just seeing the message that the parallel events uh, have been postponed. You can still submit until the 28th of December. So even after your Christmas, even after your holiday, you still have energy. Please, please, please apply. 
your voice needs to be heard there, but it's such a great platform for you to be there. So um, we will also be sharing more updates um, on what's happening with CSW, any developments, and we'll also be making sure we also link you with the various networks, NGO, CSW, uh, who are the secretariat around that. Um, so I think let me also just take this moment uh, like Rachel said, uh, FemNet, if you are not a member, we are encouraging you to please join us as a member, uh, but also just to let you know that we've also uh, launched our um, strategy. It will be going live. We are just waiting for the French uh, translation version so that we can launch it live. So we are so excited. We have launched, it's a 10 year strategy. So we talk about the decade of women, the decade of that. So we were so ambitious to say, let's also have a 10 year strategy. Of course, we'll review it every three years during our programming and general assembly. And talking about our programming and general assembly, our FemNet will be having um, our programming um, meeting next year, but we dubbed it um, the African Feminist Festival. So it's going to be a fusion of getting all the African women together, but we also have timed it in May to coin, to make sure that by before the action coalitions are launched in, in June in Paris, we as African women, uh, as many as we are in our diversity, would also have had a chance to meet and to deliberate around our strategies of engaging in the action coalitions um, just before the launch. So we'll also be having our general elections to select new boards, and this will be going three months before. So just watch out in February. This is just open for organizational members of FemNet. So we those were just some of the notices I thought I'll just let you know. And I know we have people who are not our members here, but I hope you'll be also interested in that. So let me just um, quickly ask um, uh, the Secretary of, of Feminist Board, uh, Dr. Binka from Ghana. Uh, Dr. Binka, if um, you're online, uh, just to close for us with just a few remarks. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone who connected. And Dr. Binka, I'm sure you voted on Monday um, in Ghana. <laughs> we were watching, we were impressed only yesterday to hear there were few casualties, some people still died, but we're still very much impressed with your elections uh, in Ghana. And from what we hear, the running mate was a woman. So I think this is also adding to have uh, more women um, leaders but we're also not sure how many will be in cabinet. But over to you, Dr. Binka, uh, just bear with us. I think we'll be just over three minutes of our time. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just be very quick. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Memory. You, and I want to just say a big thank you to Feminist for bringing us together. Indeed, COVID-19 has changed the world and the way we do things. And uh, I want to salute all the gallant women and men who are in this space this afternoon or since morning, our Ghana time to evening some other people's time for us to have that, this space to chat and to share ideas, our experiences and to plan for the months and the days and months ahead of the days, months and years ahead of us. Definitely, I know that the thoughts that we've shared today, the, the issues are big and they are really we, we, one person cannot do it, one country can, we have to join hands. And probably one of the good things of COVID-19 is that it has taught us that even it doesn't matter whether we are in the diaspora or we are in Africa, we are in uh, Europe or wherever you are, we can still meet and discuss. And for me, it is a special way of telling us that we are closer than we think we are. So I, this, this is a big family. And I want to tell, I want to add my voice to what the executive director of Feminet has just said that if you are not a member of Feminet, please join us because together our voice will be louder and we can be heard everywhere because together we can and we should. So let's go back to our various places and continue to ponder and share and to share ideas. And I want to also throw in that. Uh, we also need to ensure that even as we think global, we should also think national 
I will continue to think community because we are talking about real people, real women and girls whose lives we think we, we are seeking to affect positively. The Ghana situation, as you mentioned, we are still watching and hoping that there'll be no more uh, violence anywhere, but we'll live in peace. But of course, after all, we can only be one person who can be leader and then we all follow. But, uh, but in Ghana, we had about 39 women who have won to go to parliament. The previous one, there were, I think, 36 or so. So we have added three to it, and we are hoping that in the coming years, we'll get more. So together, we have more women in leadership, and that's exactly what Feminist is pushing. Our agenda is to get women's voices amplified at all levels of decision-making. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your day. Those who are still in the day and those who are in the night, enjoy a peaceful night, and may we have another day to continue the fight. Luta continue. Thank you. Hello, are we all gone? We're here. We're Hello. here, Dr. Binka. We're I here. We're seeing Luta nice. continue with you. Hey, it's <laughs> nice hearing your voice, Charity. Thank you very yeah. much. You can't see me, huh? <laughs> I can see you, Charity. All right. Thank you, bro. Yes. And God bless okay. you all. Okay. Uh, thank you. Actually, thank you so much. Uh, I have, have uh, safe holidays to everyone. And um, I don't know, Femnet, we usually finish all our meetings with a dance. Um, or do we have a brief YouTube video to watch? I know it's a Friday, but we really appreciate you. Thank you also to the secretariat, the board, the members, and to all, all the Action Coalition leaders who were here. Today we had amazing information. Thank you so much. We are confident from what we heard. We are motivated that yes, we are part of the Action Coalition and we would see as that will also be engaging and we really, really want to have our voices heard. Nothing about us without us. So we'll keep claiming yes. the space. Thank you and happy holidays to everyone. Asante sana.